Right, this short lecture is going to be about cell membrane transport. So, so far we've talked about the cell membrane of, um, of cells of the body. And in the previous lecture on cytology, there's a detailed um, description of what the cell membrane looks like, that uh, lipid bilayer that we described. And in that lecture, we also talk a little bit about how things move across the cell membrane. This lecture is just going to focus a little bit more on um, the specifics of how things move back and forth across the, the cell membrane. So remember there's passive and then there's active transport. So passive transport by definition requires no energy. So the three subdivisions of passive transport are going to be simple diffusion, which is where substance substances move from high to low concentrations down their concentration gradient. And this refers primarily to substances moving directly through the plasma membrane, just like you're seeing right here. So substances move from a high concentration to low concentration, and they're moving through the cell membrane, and they, they, this is called going down their concentration gradient. So that's simple diffusion. Osmosis is the diffusion of water. So that's the example that we see right here, where if we look what well, we're starting right here, there's a two sides in this beaker, and this side has more molecules of whatever it is. This has less, and let's assume those molecules cannot get across this membrane right here, but water can, so the water would be the pink stuff in here. And so what's going to happen is, initially, there's less water here than there is here. So there's more water here because there's less of these molecules taking up space. So water would move down its concentration gradient from a higher concentration of water to a lower concentration of water. And you would see what would happen here. It moves that way and the water basically moves to this side. Those molecules in this case cannot get across. So that's osmosis. Water moves from a high concentration to a low concentration. Then facilitated diffusion is also passive. It's a little more complex uses a transport protein or a channel to transport something again from high concentration to low concentration. So if we look at this example right here, you can see also that we're going from, we're still going from high concentration to low concentration, but we're not going directly through the cell membrane. In this case right here, we're going through what's called a channel, like a channel protein, which is an integral protein that just has an opening that allows things to pass through, but it's still going from high to low concentration, and that is facilitated diffusion. This is a little more complex right here, still going from high concentration to low concentration, but this is actually using what's called a transport protein or a carrier protein, where it actually physically grabs the molecule and pulls it across. So it's not, it's unlike a channel in that it's not just constantly open, and things cannot just flow back and forth. One more example over here, this is showing facilitated diffusion. So in this case, these molecules are moving through a membrane channel, and over here they're moving through a carrier protein. But this would be facilitated diffusion also. Now, notice all in facilitated diffusion, the substances are moving in the same direction. So one substance moving in one direction. So we call that a uniporter. So uniporter, one substance moving across in one direction. So then we have active transport. So primary active transport is what was described in the previous lecture for the most part, and it consists of ion pumps. <clears throat> so these pumps pump ions across the cell membrane. These pumps pump ions against their concentration gradient, so moving things from a low concentration to a high concentration, in other words, going uphill. So that's hard to do, thus it's going to require energy. Adenosine triphosphate is the energy source that fuels ion pumps. And in this example right here that you're seeing, you can see it's using ATP, which is the usable energy source in the body, and it's using that to move sodium and potassium ions across. So this is the classic sodium-potassium pump. Secondary active transport is a little bit different. It still requires energy, but not in the form of ATP. So the energy is supplied by concentration gradients of other ions. And in this case, more than one substance is going to move at a time, and we call this co-transport. So if you look over here at this example, you see that glucose, which is a, is a carbohydrate, it's a monosaccharide, it's kind of 
going along with sodium. So sodium is moving through this uh, transporter and glucose is kind of hanging on and going on for the ride and it just go, moves across with it. So this would be what we call a symporter example of secondary active transport. So glucose is relying on that concentration gradient of sodium to help get it across. So there's no ATP involved here. And it's symport because they're moving in the same direction. All right, so I'm gonna show you another example. So we talked about uniporters before, but symporter again is shown in this kind of archaic uh, abstract example but you can also get this working as an antiporter and that's where one substance moves one way and another substance moves the other way so calcium is involved in this a lot sodium can be too but basically what would happen is if you had one molecule uh, like say cal sodium moving this way calcium would move the other way and so they sometimes call these exchangers where one substance is exchanged for another but nevertheless, they rely on that concentrate. One, su one substance moving across relies on the concentration gradient of the other to help get it across. So that would be antiporter when they go in opposite directions, symporter if they're moving in the same directions. If it actually uses ATP and it's more, like, more of a pump, that's primary active transport. All right, so shifting gears a, gears a little bit, I wanted to talk about the membrane potential of of cells. So the membrane potential refers to that electrical charge across the cell membrane. This is going to be really important when we talk about muscle contraction and also the nervous system and how neurons work in the nervous system. So at rest cells are going to have what's called a membrane potential, meaning that there's not the same electrical charge on either side of the cell membrane. So at rest most cells of the body have a resting membrane potential between somewhere between negative 50 and negative 90 uh, millivolts and we call that the resting membrane potential and that negative sign means the inside of the cell is more negative compared to the outside so if you just to reinforce this if the inside of a cell was 70 millivolts more negative than the outside so if the inside of a cell was more negative than the outside its membrane potential would be negative 70 if the outside was more negative it would be uh, positive 70. So it's all relative to the outside of the cell. So why is the resting membrane potential negative? That's the big question here and that requires a pretty big discussion which we're going to go through right now. And so I always break it down to three reasons why you have a negative resting membrane potential. So partially it's due to the concentration of ions and substances on either side of the cell, inside versus the outside. It is also due, it was due mainly to the relative ion permeabilities because the cell membrane is more permeable to some ions versus others. And then we also have the, the role of ion pumps and how these ion pumps uh, contribute to this resting membrane potential. So one thing I want to just point out in this picture, and this is a picture straight from the, the textbook, you can see that they have all these ions. This is the outside of the cell. This is the inside of the cell. Here's your cell membrane. But you see that, relatively speaking, there's a lot more sodium on the outside compared to the inside. There's a lot more potassium on the inside versus the outside. There's more chloride on the outside versus the inside. And then also on the inside, you have these big proteins. So these have a negative charge associated with them. So if we look at that in a little more detail, which we're going to do on the next slide, you can see how the concentrations contribute to this resting membrane potential. But the other thing I want to point out is because you're, you're going to see this picture or this little sketch a lot. This is just showing a cell membrane and a cell at rest. It's more negative on the inside, more positive on the outside. So bullet point number one ion concentrations. So the major ions playing a role here would be potassium, sodium, calcium, chloride. So the first thing I want you to do is just notice where they're highly concentrated. Sodium is a pretty big player here. Sodium is more highly concentrated on the outside versus the inside. If you actually look at the numbers, outside uh, 145, inside 20. Potassium is more highly concentrated on the inside versus the outside. So 150 on the inside, 4 on the outside. 
Calcium is more highly concentrated on the outside. You see the numbers here. Chloride also more highly concentrated on the outside. So if you just look at those charges, you see that, and, and this is just counting uh, numbers, you got three positive charges, because calcium has two, a negative, and then a positive with potassium on the inside. So just that in itself, you get a little more positivity on the outside. But then another big factor here are these proteins and phosphate groups on the inside. And they have a negative charge associated with them. So this also adds to that negativity on the inside. So more overall negativity here on the inside, more positivity on the outside. So then the big player here is the permeability of the ions. So in other words, the cell membrane is permeable to these ions. It's not generally permeable to the proteins, but ions can get across, but they're not all equally permeable, meaning that you won't get the same amount of potassium leaking across as you would sodium leaking in. And so at rest, you have these channels called leak channels, and they allow for like a constant leak of ions. And so I'm just going to pose this question so you can hopefully understand this. What would happen if the cell membrane was only permeable to potassium? So here's potassium. Okay. If we assume that these things can't get across, the proteins and phosphates are stuck inside, the calcium, sodium, chloride are stuck outside, but uh, potassium could go back and forth as it pleased, think about what would happen. Well, we just established that there's more potassium on the inside versus the outside. So at rest, what would happen is, due to its concentration gradient, you'd get potassium leaking out. And it would leak out until something happened. So let's just kind of talk through this. So if the cell membrane was only permeable to potassium, potassium would exit the cell. Okay, so that would just go right through. And think about how that would affect the inside of the cell. So potassium has a positive charge, so if you get more potassium leaving, the inside of the cell becomes more negative. So I'm gonna put this negative sign in there. And then potassium is gonna keep leaving until it balances out. And so what I mean by balancing out is, at some point, you're gonna get so much negativity inside the cell that it's gonna start wanting to pull potassium back in because a negative and a positive charge attract each other. So at that exact point where you get potassium, enough potassium leaving to be pulled in by this negative, or you get enough negative charge in here to start pulling back the potassium, that's known as the equilibrium, equilibrium potential for potassium. So potassium is going to leave until the inside of the cell is negative enough to oppose the outward movement of potassium. And this potential is called the equilibrium potential for potassium. All right, so that's basically where it balances out. So if this has been established, but the equilibrium potential for potassium is about negative 90 millivolts. So if you just let the cell as it was, and it was only permeable to potassium, it would go to about negative 90 millivolts on the inside compared to the outside. And you would get a membrane potential of negative 90. So in reality, it's not the cell membrane is not only permeable to potassium though. So we have to consider a few other factors, but potassium is the big player here. So I'm just gonna state this for the record, an equilibrium potential is the membrane potential that will exactly balance the chemical force due to the concentration gradient. All right, so I'm gonna do the same thing, but this time I wanna just envision what would happen to sodium. So sodium's highly concentrated on the outside lower concentration on the inside. Let's assume that the cell membrane was only permeable to sodium. Well, due to its concentration gradient, you would expect it to leak inward, right? So sodium would enter, so I'm gonna put an arrow there, and it would make the inside of the cell more positive. Sodium has a positive charge, and it would come in until it reached its equilibrium potential. So basically it would come in until the inside of the cell was so positive that it would not, the charge the charges would kind of repel each other. And so it would come in until the inside was positive enough to oppose the inward movement of sodium. And thus people have established that the equilibrium potential for sodium is about positive 60. All right, now this 
is important to consider because if you would if if you're following this you might think well if sodium and potassium had the same permeability you would expect the resting membrane potential to be somewhere between negative 90 and positive 60 maybe halfway so maybe closer to zero or maybe like negative 10 negative 20 something like that but in reality the resting membrane potential in a lot of cells is in that range that I showed you earlier and if we look at a neuron it's like negative 70 so what does that tell us it tells us that potassium is the big player so at rest the cell membrane is most permeable to potassium compared to other ions so taken together since the cell membrane is most permeable to potassium at rest and only slightly permeable to sodium the resting membrane is closest to the equal equilibrium potential for potassium. And so although the cell membrane is slightly permeable to other ions, but most permeable to potassium, you're going to get a, a membrane potential at rest that's close to that equilibrium potential of potassium. So for example, like I said, neurons have a resting membrane potential of negative 70. And so you can see a neuron here, negative on the inside, positive on the outside. And like I said, this is really important when we start talking about how neurons work because they play off of this resting membrane potential to send electrical signals. All right, so lastly, the other thing that contributes to the resting membrane potential is the sodium-potassium pump. And we've talked about this before, but long story short, it's located on the uh, cell membrane, pumps three sodium out, two potassium in for each ATP adds to the negative rest, resting membrane potential, so it's considered to be electrogenic. So in other words, three positive charges out, two positive charges in. If you keep track of that over time, you're going to have more positive on the outside versus the inside. So overall, though, this plays a small role compared to the relative permeability that we just finished talking about. All right, so the last thing I want to cover here is the concept of tonicity. So tonicity refers to the ability of a solution to change the shape of a cell. And this is important because it basically is related to osmosis. So I just want to take you through a few examples and then kind of finish up here. Um, so imagine that a cell has five sodium molecules inside it. Obviously that's not realistic, but let's just say that it's true so you can see this. So these three cells have all have five sodium molecules inside of them. This cell was put in a solution that had five sodium molecules in it. So the concentration of the solution it's in is exactly the same as the environment inside the cell. So they have the same concentration inside versus outside if you look at sodium. So you would get no net movement of water here because it had water it also has the exact same concentration because they have the same concentration of sodium ions. So if it was placed in a solution that also had five sodium ions there would be no net movement of water via osmosis and this is what we would call an isotonic solution because it has the same concentration as inside the cell. Now if we take that same cell with five sodium ions and we put it in a solution that only has two that would be a hypotonic solution because there's a lower concentration in the solution versus the concentration inside the cell. So based on osmosis you're going to get osmosis or water moving from a high concentration of water to a lower concentration of water. So if you put a cell in a hypotonic solution like this, water is going to come in, you have a net movement of water in the cell, and the cell is going to start to swell up and it might explode. And that would not be good. So lastly, if we did the opposite, we put that same cell with five sodium ions, we put it in a solution that it has a higher concentration of sodium. I'm just going to say 10 molecules of sodium, just to envision this. That would be called a hypertonic solution, and you would get a net movement of water moving out via osmosis. So low concentration of water here, move, I'm sorry, a higher concentration of water here, moving to a lower concentration of water here. And that would be called, well, it's osmosis, but this solution would be hypertonic. So what would happen here is that cell would start to shrink because it's losing water. All right, so just to reinforce this, if you put a cell, these are red blood cells. You put a cell in an isotonic solution, it's going to be fine. It's going to retain its normal shape. No net movement of water back and forth via osmosis. Uh, if you put a cell, the next one we did in that previous slide was this. You put a cell in a hypotonic solution. 
the cell is going to take on water by osmosis. Um, and eventually it's going to start to swell and become bloated and, and could explode, or lice as they would call it. And then if you put a cell in a hypertonic solution, you're going to get a net movement of water out of the cell, and the cell is going to start to shrink. And that's what you're seeing here.